our speaker today um, is uh, Rob Davis. Um, Rob uh, went to medical school in uh, Guadalajara, where he had to do a lot of his learning in Spanish and is, is bilingual as a result. Um, his talk today is entitled 4T score and laboratory testing for diagnosis of heparin induced thrombocytopenia. So, Rob. Good morning, everybody. In the early 20th century, George Bellows painted a series of powerful boxers delivering violent hits. This series became an important part of the American legacy of art. At the same time, scientists across the world in research laboratories were participating in a revolution in medicine that delivered some of the first powerful blows against diseases. That revolution came to the United States in large part because of this man a rich railroad baron in the Gilded Age of the 19th century. Upon his death, he bequested 7 million, 140 million today, for a free hospital and affiliated medical school and university. These were the first in the United States to incorporate a model that combined te teaching and research in the same institution. The man's name, Johns Hopkins. And it was in one of those research lab laboratories exactly 100 years ago that a second year medical student isolated a fat soluble anticoagulant in canine liver tissue. <clears throat> it came to be known as heparin. Today, heparin is one of the most widely used medications in hospitals and a first line treatment for thrombosis as well as myocardial infarction but it can also lead to devastating consequences and the most violent hit of them all. Today I'll be discussing heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. My name is Rob Davis. I'm a second year medical resident at Rochester General, and it's really a privilege to be with you and discuss these things today. Um, the title of my talk, as Dr. Patak mentioned, is no hit for T-score and laboratory testing to rule out heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. My agenda for today will go over the mechanism of clotting, heparin, and HIT. We'll go over a clinical case that illustrates challenges in the diagnosis of HIT. And then we'll go over some of the literature, and then I'll conclude. So an understanding of clotting is very helpful to understand the mechanism of HIT. So here we have a blood vessel and its wall has been breached. It exposes some endothelial collagen as well as von Willebrand factor. And the three A's of primary hemostasis are platelet adhesion, activation, and aggregation. And the second A, which is platelet activation, is particularly important in HIT. Simultaneously, we have secondary hemostasis, where the extrinsic and the intrinsic coagulation cascades meet at factor 10. They lead to activation of thrombin, which cleaves fibrinogen and forms a fibrin net around the clot. One of the checks in this system is antithrombin-3, and antithrombin-3 blocks the action of thrombin. The mechanism of heparin is to bind to antithrombin-3, induce a conformational change, and increase the activity of antithrombin-3 by a thousandfold. So now to the mechanism of HIT. As we saw in platelet activation, it releases platelet factor 4. And platelet factor 4 binds to heparin and neutralizes its effect. But this bound complex can be antigenic and antibodies can form to the complex. When these hit antibodies bind to the FC receptor on platelets, they can cause platelet activation with further release of platelet factor 4. So let's look at a real life example. We have the puzzle buckle, which many of you parents will be familiar with in your child's car seats. 
And on the left side, we have heparin. The right side is represented by a platelet factor four. When these two come together and form a complex, at that point, they can be bound by the HIT antibody. And what happens then will illustrate with a little video with my daughter Lucy starring as we put her into her car seat. Let's, there we go. So here we can see that it, the antibody has caused platelet activation and the activated platelet releases granules including further platelet factor 4. Now this platelet factor 4 can cause a positive feedback loop and lead to unregulated platelet activation. So we're, here we have uh, un, unregulated activated platelets. The consequences can be devastating. It, it can lead to arterial thrombosis, skin necrosis, as well as amputation with high morbidity and high mortality. Now, not all of the HIT antibodies lead to thrombosis. And what this pyramid illustrates is that it, it, um, in a broader group, the antibodies are formed but only a smaller percentage actually develops thrombocytopenia and an even smaller group develops the thrombosis. So some of the epidemiology of HIT, on the left we have 12 million patients per year in hospitals who are exposed to heparin. And you can see that the incidence is 0.2 to 5% and that varies depending on the group. Now, there was a 10-year quality improvement initiative that was published this year in blood, and they showed that low molecular weight heparin has a lower incidence of HIT than unfractionated heparin. And the figures from their study at a center in Canada showed that there were two, the incidence was 2.2 per 10,000 admissions when low molecular weight heparin was used compared to 10.7 per 10,000 admissions when unfractionated heparin was used. And then obviously these are the numbers that they used for their thrombosis. So HIT affects different groups of patients differently. And on the left, you can see that the group most affected is cardiac surgical patients. In up to 50% of those patients, they develop a HIT antibody. But you can see above the water that 2% develop thrombocytopenia and 1% develop thrombosis. Contrast that to the orthopedic patient group, where a smaller percentage develop the antibody but you can see that 5% develop thrombocytopenia and 3% develop thrombosis. And as we move to the right towards the medical group, the numbers are decreased. So here's a clinical case that illustrates some of the challenges in the diagnosis of HIT. Here we have a 78-year-old male who presented with fall and was found to be septic. He was admitted to the medical ICU and he was started on a heparin drip for presumed enstemi. He had an elevated troponin. And these are his platelet counts during the first few days of admission. As you can see, on day one of his admission, his count, platelet count was 148. And by day four, it had dropped to 73. So the medical team asked the question, does this patient have HIT? Well, that, the diagnosis of HIT is a difficult one. Why is it so difficult? One reason is that so many hospitalized patients develop thrombocytopenia. And in fact, in one study, it showed that in intensive care units, up to 50% of those patients develop thrombocytopenia. Another study showed that only 0.4% of intensive care unit patients develop HIT. The diagnosis of HIT is a clinical pathological, meaning that you need clinical criteria as well as a laboratory evidence of the disease. 
The clinical score that is most frequently used is the 4T score. And we, we use enzyme amino assays as well as functional assays, in, including the serotonin release assay to make the lab diagnosis. So the 4T score assesses, assesses patients in four different categories, thrombocytopenia, timing, thrombosis, and other causes, and gives them zero, one, or two points depending on the extent to which that supports the diagnosis of it. Interpreting the 4T score, patients are, are divided into three categories, low probability, intermediate probability, or high probability for HIT. So now we're gonna look at the first study of this presentation, and it's the study that validated the 4T score, and it was published in 2006. It was a multi-center prospective study that was done at two centers in Canada as well as Germany. And they correlated the 4T score with the results of laboratory testing. And here are the results that they came up with. You can see the categorized 4T scores on the left and the results of the laboratory testing in the different groups. And notably, in the 4T's low score category, only one of 64 patients in the Canada group and zero of 55 in the German group tested positive by laboratory testing for HIT. So they concluded that a low 4T score rules out HIT in the majority of cases with a high negative predictive value. As far as the intermediate or, four, or high 4T score, their conclusion was that there were varying implications in different clinical settings. The strengths of the study were that it was prospective, it was multi-center, and limitations were that there was a significant difference in the intermediate and high score groups from one center to another. There was also a difference in the scores. In Canada, they were hematologists. In Germany, they were various physicians. The limitations of the 4T score in general are, first of all, that the 4T score has never been directly compared with another method of diagnosis of HIT. Second, the 4T score is not always clear cut and different factors influencing that are missing laboratory data or the other possible causes of thrombocytopenia. And it has a low positive predictive value. So in 2012, Dr. Sucre et al. published a meta-analysis and they included 13 studies in over 3,000 patients. Their goal was to determine the predictive value of the 4T score. And they, was, <clears throat> they found that in patients with a low 4T score, there continued to be a high negative predictive value of 0 0.998 for the di diagnosis of HIT. The intermediate and high score positive predictive values were 0 0.14 and 0 0.64 respectively. So when we look back at our patient, how can these studies guide us? Well, let's calculate the 4T score in our patient. As you can see, he scores two points for thrombocytopenia, but in the other three categories, he doesn't score any points. So his total score would be two, and that would put him in the low probability category for a hit. And yet, we are doctors, and when we suspect something, we want to test for it. When we suspect sepsis, we send cultures. When we suspect ACS, we send troponins. When we suspect pancreatitis, we send the lipase. And our reflex, when we suspect HIT, can be to send the heparin PF4 enzyme amino assay. All of you are shaking your head because you know it's true. <laughs> <coughs> the, the enzyme amino assay was sent in this patient. And as you can see, it was positive, but just slightly above the cutoff of 0 0.496. So a little bit about the enzyme amino assay. It detects heparin platelet factor IV antibodies. There are assays that detect all antibodies versus IgG only, which IgG is the active antibody in HIT. 
It's a quantitative analysis uh, measured in optical density with a high sensitivity, but it has a low specificity. It can detect pathogenic as well as non-pathogenic antibodies, and this can lead to overdiagnosis. Here we have a graph that shows that the optical density, it's uh, the score of optical density um, is related to the probability that the serotonin release assay will be positive. And if we look at our patient, he fell into the 0.4 to 1 group. That gives him a probability of less than 5% of being positive on the serotonin release assay. And this is a picture of the assay that we use at Rochester General Hospital. You can see that the darker the color, the higher the optical density and the more likely that the patient has hit. So in our patient, what do we do? We have a low 4T score, but a positive enzyme amino assay. So the serotonin release assay was sent to further clarify the diagnosis, but in the meantime, the hands were tied. We can't continue heparin, and so the medical team started the patient on expensive alternative anticoagulation. About the serotonin release assay, it works on the concept that during platelet activation, there's a release of dense granules as well, with, which contain serotonin. The serotonin release assay is the gold standard for laboratory testing of HIT. It has a high sensitivity and specificity. Its limitations are that they use radioactive serotonin, and not many labs in the United States run this assay, which leads to long wait times for results. And the other question is, it's a positive laboratory diagnosis, but it is a laboratory and clinical diagnosis. How predictive is it actually of HIT being present? So the serotonin release assay came back six days later, and as you can see, it was negative. At that point, heparin was resumed. So this highlights one of the other problems in diagnosis of HIT, which is overdiagnosis. And this can lead to increased costs as well as unnecessary use of alternative anticoagulation. So there was a group in Washington that took aim at this. Their goal was to decrease costs and unnecessary testing for HIT and they implemented a computer-based provider order entry as an intervention, and they did an observational study to see the effect. So the intervention was an EMR-based clinical decision support tool. What it did was when someone submitted the order for enzyme immunoassay, it required that the 4T score be calculated. And positive enzyme immunoassays were reflexed to serotonin release assays. The period of study was eight months prior to and then eight months following the intervention. And the primary outcome was the number of tests sent inappropriately, meaning that the test was sent in a patient with a low 4T score. Secondary outcomes included the mean 4T score, the number of tests total that were sent and the proportion tested that had a low 4T score. And here are the results. And as you can see in their primary outcome of inappropriate testing, there was a significant reduction from 18 per month to eight per month. There were also significant differences in the mean 4T score from three to 3.4 and the number of tests sent from 43 to 22. And the, the proportion of those tested despite a low 4T score was also reduced, although it wasn't quite significant. So this was just a single center study, and yet they showed strong results and a reduced number, they, they met their goals. And so, Rochester General Hospital, we like to follow success. And the hematology department has actually submitted a ticket to CareConnect so that this decision uh, guide tool can be implemented here at CareConnect. 
we all know about pop-up fatigue, but we do believe that this will decrease the number of unnecessary tests and lead to decreased overdiagnosis. And so Dr. Quidi's um, pitch to you guys when this is implemented, as well as a clip to help us get into the home stretch of my talk, is this. So let's do this thing. <laughs> All right. So let's do this. So the last topic that I would like to address is the Fortis Intermediate Group. The Fortis Intermediate Group also poses quite a challenge in diagnosis of HIT. And the reason why is because, as we saw in the meta-analysis, they have a low positive predictive value of only 0.14. And yet, there's sufficient suspicion of HIT that we stop heparin and we start alternative anticoagulation. So what can be done about this? There was a study published in 2015 where a group sought to use a rapid assay in order to help further guide decisions regarding the intermediate 4T score. This was a single center prospective study and they calculated the 4T score and then they had a point of care test that was a particle gel immunoassay with results that would return in 15 minutes for rapid detection of HIT antibody. <clears throat> they, uh, they calculated the 4T score and did the rapid assay and then compared these results to the results of the serotonin release assay. And based on the 4T score as well as the rapid assay testing, they divided these patients into two categories. The one category of no treatment and the other category of those who were treated for HIT. Their primary outcome was management failures, meaning those in the no treatment category who had a positive serotonin release assay for HIT. And their secondary outcomes were the predictive values of the 4Ts and the rapid assay as well as major events, including thromboembolic, bleeding, and death. So as far as the study flow, 1,781 assay requests were sent, and of those, 526 were analyzed. And these are the results. And two things that I want to point out from the results. On the left, we have the four T-score categories. And going across the top, we have the results of the different assays. The first thing is that there were six management failures, meaning no treatment group that tested positive on the serotonin release assay. And as you can see, all of these patients were in the 4T's low score category, and all of them tested positive for the rapid assay. Now, one of the things that that brings up is that the 4T score is sometimes difficult to calculate. And this can be due to lack of lab data or other reasons. And so sometimes there is a question about the 4T score that we come up with. The second thing is that you can see in the patients in the intermediate score category, of the 137 in that category, none of them tested positive by laboratory, by serotonin release assay for HIT. So their conclusions reflected these results. And the first thing that they addressed was in the low 4T score category, in some of these patients, there's uncertainty. And they suggested that their rapid assay could be useful when there is uncertainty to distinguish whether it should be suspected or not. The second thing is in the intermediate 4T score category. They, they concluded that a rapid assay was helpful in ruling out HIT if it was negative or suspecting HIT if it was positive. The strengths that were that it was a prospective and the investigators were blinded. Uh, it addressed an important need, which was to further clarify diagnosis in this uh, intermediate 4Ts group and decreased time to a result as it was a point of care test. 
the limitations were that it's a, it was a single center study and uh, the platelet factor four heparin particle gel amino assay that was used at this center isn't widely used in other hospitals. So if a hospital wanted to adopt the algorithm used in this study, they would have to bring in that assay. And now I conclude. We've looked at a lot of literature and hopefully learned a lot about HIT. First of all, HIT is a devastating complication of the use of heparin that can lead to thrombosis, skin necrosis, and amputation. Secondly, low molecular weight heparin uh, has a decreased incidence of HIT than unfractionated heparin. The 4T score is very useful, particularly to rule out HIT in those with a low 4T score. And a clinical decision guide can also be useful in decreasing unnecessary testing as well as overdiagnosis. So stay tuned for that at Rochester General Hospital. And lastly, there is a potential role for a rapid assay in patients with an intermediate 4T score. I'd like to give a special thanks to all of these people, as well as uh, uh, I really thank you for listening to this presentation. And these are my references. And if you have any questions, um, I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you.